Okay, we're going to be recording today's webinar. So it'll be available to everyone um, after we're done. Um, but good morning. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, protecting Drupal sites from spam. And we're going to do a case study of Drupal.org. Um, the Drupal Association has re recently partnered with Distilled Networks to come up with a modern solution for handling spam on the home of the community. Um, and we've been really pleased with the results. So we'd like to talk to you today about how we put that solution together and how we've worked with Distill and how some of their techniques can be extended to protect uh, other Drupal sites in the future. Um, so uh, with that said, uh, let me do some introductions. My name is Tim Lennon. I'm the Director of Eng Engineering for the Drupal Association. And I'll let my co-host Edward introduce himself. Hey, I'm uh, Edward Roberts and I head up product marketing for Distill Networks. So pleased to be here. Awesome, and thank you for joining, Edward. Um, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, Drupal.org uh, faces some significant challenges when it comes to spam that are comparable to, um, uh, to a high value, high traffic website um, that would be a significant target for spammers. Um, in particular, those challenges are, we're a page rank nine site, which means that any content that winds up on Drupal.org immediately hits the top of search engines, no matter what part of our site it's posted on. And that makes it uh, a really valuable target for uh, anyone promoting you know, SEO spam or link spam, things of that nature. Um, we're also wide open to user-generated content. Um, uh, we have an open user registration. Anyone can create an account. Because we're a community website, all of our content is generated by our users. And this means that um, we can't just lock everything down to keep people from coming in and, and posting spam. And furthermore, because we're a nonprofit and a volunteer driven community, we don't have much capacity for manual moderation. So we can't rely on um, human power uh, in the, the spam fight. Um, so what's the cost of spam? Um, and why is fighting it so important for uh, a site like Drupal.org and for um, uh, sites in general? Uh, for us in particular, we have to uh, carefully uh, shepherd the resources of the community. Um, and so constantly fighting spam re results in volunteer burnout. When volunteers are fighting spam, instead of making code contributions, we're not making the best use of their time. Furthermore, um, the noise of spammy content can overwhelm the signal of important news about the project. Um, uh, it also um, can degrade our search presence. Um, as most of you may know, if a search engine finds uh, uh, consistent and overwhelming amounts of spam on a website, they'll start to reduce page rank and reduce your, your presence in search results. And that kind of degradation could lead to a decline in adoption for the project. Um, besides that, there's also just some technical challenges and problems. Um, a high volume of spam account registrations and spam content increases our database size that we have to manage and it pollutes our community metrics. We can't measure the growth or decline of our community if we're, uh, if the majority of traffic is coming from these spam accounts. Um, it really, it hides the, um, the real information about our community and all that noise. Um, so I'd like to give a brief history of uh, Drupal.org and how we fought spam in the past. Um, Drupal.org is actually the longest running Drupal site on the web um, and one of the most highly trafficked. And so our solutions have evolved as Drupal has. We've actually been online for more than a decade. Um, so in the early days of spam fighting, a couple techniques emerged that I think people are widely familiar with. And I'll talk about why these are good techniques, but how, they, um, how they've fallen behind in the uh, kind of uh, constant arms race against spam. So uh, these early techniques that, the, that uh, appeared were behavior analysis and content analysis. And as any Drupal site owner knows, there's kind of two modules that were the go-to for Drupal users um, uh, uh, looking to fight spam. The first was the honeypot module, which uses a hidden fields technique where uh, bots uh, that are coming to your site to promote spam uh, fill in this field that humans don't see and anything that fills that field is discarded. Uh, it also offers some rate limiting features and things like that. The problem with this module is that as bots have grown more sophisticated, as humans who program these bots intervene to target specific high value websites like Drupal.org, uh, human eyes can go in, identify those hidden fields, and write the bots to work around them. Uh, similarly, content analysis techniques um, are always part of 
uh, uh, spam fighting in the traditional sense, text analytics to look for spammy content, um, either outright rejecting certain content um, uh, or accepting it if it seems clear or marking it as unsure and throwing up a CAPTCHA. And Malum is kind of the traditional solution that um, most Drupal sites are, are, are used to. It's a tool we still use, but um, we found that it's been falling behind the sheer volume of spam and that it's in particular not a good solution in a multilingual environment. Um, so while we use both Honeypot and Malum still today, um, it hasn't been sufficient really to, um, to meet the needs for, for protecting our community's home. Um, so you know, as I said before, uh, these are good tools, but spam fighting is an arms race. And um, the people who generate spam have a direct financial incentive to keep finding new ways and new techniques um, to beat our protections. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what modern spam looks like. Um, modern spam uh, uh, comes sort of in two forms and they're closely related to each other. First, you have um, uh, humans behind proxies where um, real human users are using automation tools, um, including bots as part of their toolkit um, to identify uh, specific websites to target um, create mass account registrations using proxies each time to avoid IP detection, and then use that as the basis for their spam attacks. Um, in addition to that, you also have bots that are growing more and more sophisticated and finding new ways to get around the more traditional protections that are in place uh, against the kind of old fashioned unsophisticated bots. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, humans behind proxies because some of these attacks are the kind that um, have most recently had an impact on Drupal.org, and um, we use Distill Solution in an interesting way to resolve this problem. And then um, after I talk about that, I'll hand it over to Edward to talk about uh, bad bot detection and how to handle these more sophisticated kinds of bots. So um, human spammers. Um, again, they're still using extensive automation tools. Um, they have a human-driven process but they, um, uh, they use a variety of different tools like automatic proxy changes, like um, uh, automatic browser driving tools, things like that to speed up the process. Um, and that extensive use of proxies helps to obscure the multiple bad actions they take all coming from the same source. Um, so against Drupal.org, the pattern of attack is um, relatively straightforward. Um, these spammers are building inventory for Black Hat SEO and link spam primarily. Um, so what we see is that um, what turns out to be just a few users, a few real human beings, are creating dozens or hundreds of accounts each using proxies to obscure their identity, and then either immediately trying to post spam with those accounts or holding those accounts as sleeper inventory to then activate when they are paid by some company to provide Black Hat um, link spam. Um, so what's the solution that we put together? Um, with Distill Network's help, um, we've started running Drupal.org's account registration process through the Distill Network's cloud CDN. Um, Distill uh, uses their uh, proprietary high-def fingerprint technique to identify the kinds of users that um, uh, traffic whatever page or whatever part of your website is being protected, in our case, the registration process. Um, and so what we can do is we can collect this information, this high def fingerprint uh, for these users. And then even when these users attempt to change proxies and disguise their identity, we can actually detect, no, that's the same person and prevent them from making these additional dozens to hundreds of accounts uh, that then become activated um, as uh, spam attacks. Um, so, that sounds nice in principle, but um, how, do, how has it actually worked for us? Um, how can we kind of demonstrate the results? There's a couple metrics for success. Um, first is the rate of unconfirmed users being created on Drupal.org. So the concept of a confirmed user is unique to the Drupal community, but um, essentially what it means is um, when a user account is first created, it has relatively limited um, uh, permissions to, to take action within our community website until another human user looks at their content, recognizes, yeah, that's a real human being and confirms them. But we have this pool of unconfirmed users, which represents all the new users on Drupal.org that haven't been vouched for yet, but also all of the accounts that may have been created by spammers, by bots, um, that might be kind of black hat and malicious accounts. So if, if we're 
if we're seeing this technique be successful, then we should see that the rate of unconfirmed users being created uh, goes down. Similarly, the rate at which we have to do manual moderation should also drop if this technique is working. Um, if we're preventing these dozens or hundreds of accounts from being created, then the rate at which we have to block accounts uh, should go down. So um, let's take a look at some of the results. Um, as I said before, um, when we implemented these techniques, we're looking for that rate of unconfirmed users, the pool of potential spammers to drop. So this graph shows um, the weekly rolling average of accounts created per day. So prior to um, our relationship with Distill, we were seeing um, approximately 300 accounts created per day on average on Drupal.org, spiking to almost 600 um, in October of 2015. That was the uh, signal to us that we needed to get in gear and really do something about this problem. Uh, so you can see on the chart, when we first enabled Distill pr Protection, there was an immediate drop off in these account registrations. Um, we actually went to less than half of the number of daily account registrations uh, that were occurring. Um, from there, we found we had to do a little bit of tuning because we wanted to make sure that um, some legitimate registrations weren't getting blocked. Um, so we tuned things a little bit and leveled off um, at uh, a little bit over 150 account registrations on average per day, which was just slightly above half of what we had before we implemented pr uh, protection and less than a quarter of what it had peaked at when this attack really, um, uh, really hit us hard. Uh, from there, we uh, brought some of our findings about using Distill Network's uh, high-def fingerprinting and some of the new technologies that they developed um, and enabled uh, a new blacklisting process uh, based on kind of the next generation of their high-def fingerprint, uh, which let us blacklist the bad actor patterns in an even more robust way. And so now we're seeing an even uh, more significant decline uh, in recent months um, uh, below that 150 account mark and actually steadily decreasing on average, um, which is a huge win. Similarly, um, I talked about how we wanted to measure this through the number of the amount of manual moderation that we had to do. So looking at a similar period of time, you can see this spike in uh, how many accounts we had to block uh, as a rolling average every day. Uh, and you can also tell from this graph, uh, which shows, you know, a peak at 200, that when we're having a peak of 600 being created, there are more that are coming through that are slipping through the lines and remaining as sleeper accounts because they haven't been activated right away. Um, so it's even more important because that evidence shows us that we were missing uh, some of these accounts and we needed to stop them before it started. Um, so if I zoom in on this more recent segment of data, which represents when we um, implemented uh, some of these techniques, you can see that the decline in the amount of manual moderation that we and the community volunteers have had to do um, is really dramatic. Um, we get to this point where we're at a rolling average of, of five or fewer accounts being blocked either by staff or community members um, uh, in, a, in a given week. So it's really been a big, big improvement for us. Um, so the results for us have been totally dramatic. Um, and our solution, one of the advantages of using Distill um, as uh, our partner in this is that it evolves as they evolve their own techniques and as they recognize the malicious actions and update uh, their tools uh, to better detect um, to better detect new spam attacks in this ongoing arms race. Um, but in addition to blocking these bad human actors, there's still the bad bots to address. And I'm going to hand it over here to Edward to talk about um, bad bot detection and mitigation. Thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, I think it's it's really interesting that you you call it an arms race because uh, that's clearly the the battle that you know companies are on with this sort of uh, you know malicious behavior it's you do one thing and so they they change their behavior you do another thing to to stop them and then they change their behavior again um so that that graph where you're seeing little incremental improvements is is, is exactly sort of the arms race that that happens in in this sphere um so i th i think one of the things that's interesting about the, the drupal uh, example here that, that that we've seen is that it's using our fingerprint in in perhaps a different way than um many uh, other uh, solutions use us because um, many other solutions use us to clean out sort of bad bot or order automated traffic um, that is doing something on their site that is not 
you know, not beneficial to the business. Um, and so you're using the fingerprint to actually say, okay, there's humans on here that, that, that are doing malicious things and we need to identify them and use the fingerprint. So using the technology of Distill, which, which is this high def fingerprint, um, is enabling that. So it's, it's interesting that this is the sort of yin to the yang of our typical um, uh, sort of bot problem that we see. So um, if I just give a, a little bit of example of that and then I'll talk a bit more about the fingerprint so that people sort of understand um, what you're taking advantage of. Um, hopefully it'll sort of illuminate the picture. Um, so w from our bad bot report, we do an annual report that comes out every year and it uh, came out a few weeks ago for this year. Um, we see that, you know, almost half, 40% of traffic is, is some form of bots and only 61% is actually humans. Um, there are, there are two types of bots. There are bots that you actually want on your site, and that would be your, your search engines because they enable you to get found, and so you want them crawling your site and scraping you and, and indexing things. Um, so you would want those on your site so that you would allow them. So that's 18.8% you know, 18, um, 18 of traffic would be good bots. But the other portion, which is you know, almost 20%, are bad bots and they're doing things that you don't want on your site typically. Um, one could be they could be scraping your content, scraping your prices, they could be running vulnerability scanners, they could be doing what they did at Drupal, they could be dropping spam um, and, and sort of using that to sort of gain advantage. Um, they could be committing online fraud, um, you know, trying to access credit cards, running credit card numbers, trying to card crack. Um, they could be, you know, defrauding your ads, you know, fake clicks um, and, and making you pay for people that aren't actually clicking on it it's because it's actually a bot doing it so there's there's a whole plethora of things that bad bots can be doing and it's really understanding what your site does um that and, and what what your site holds will sort of understand the scale of the problem and so drupal understanding that they've got this subsection of humans who are you know creating multiple accounts and then being identified to be in, able to identify those using the high def fingerprint is the same process, but it's basically looking for malicious behavior and then saying, how do we identify, we've now identified this behavior, multiple accounts, and then using that fingerprint to block and, and prevent them. Um, and the interesting thing is that the evolving bot landscape is what are bad bots doing, right? They have some capabilities that, you know, exactly what, what Tim was saying was that they, they're, they're rotating IP addresses. They, you know, they're, you know, three quarters of them can sit there and just quickly do that. So if you're going to start blocking on IP addresses, they're just going to rotate to another one. Now you're playing the game of whack-a-mole trying to block the next IP address. And, you know, and, and, and obviously that's a fun game if you're, a, uh, you know, if you're, you're dealing with protecting a site. So, um, you know, that's something that's obviously not an effective technique um, for, for handling this problem. Um, almost 40% of them are, are trying to be evasive. They're trying to make themselves look like a real, uh, real user behind a real browser. Um, and they're mimicking human behavior, whether it be moving their mouse or, or clicking, you know, delaying for clicks, um, delaying and pausing between clicks. Um, and half of them can actually load JavaScript. So again, they're, they're, they're doing things that sort of what a browser can do and a normal user behind a browser, you, you would expect them to do. So they're trying to hide in plain sight, basically. Um, and then again, 60% of them are hiding in data centers. So if you're gonna start blocking whole data centers, you're gonna be blocking a lot of real users. So blocking IP addresses or, 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 or complete data centers is obviously a non-starter. So you need something else that allows you to block. And that's again where, where this high def fingerprint comes in. Um, and so I just wanted to sort of explain um, a little bit behind what's the advantage of the high def fingerprint. Um, you know, a lot of fingerprinting tools, um, you know, have the IP address, they have some sort of header and user agent information. They might even cookie the browser, um, you know, and so the first three there on the list, uh, I think a lot of solutions have some form of that and they claim it to be a fingerprint um, because they've, they've gone beyond the IP address. Uh, at this still, we've, we've added a, another 200 attributes of data. Um, that makes it far more granular, far more difficult to, to, to sort of hide uh, amongst those attributes. Um, so if you change your IP address and all those other 200 plus attributes still say the same, um, we, can, we can identify you um, based on the fingerprint, not just based on a rotating list of IP addresses. Um, and we've also added a whole tamper-proofing layer to sort of, so people can't be sort of manipulating um, the, 
the, the fingerprint and altering it and, and, and stuffing it with, with different pieces of information or values. Um, and so um, this is the fingerprint that, that Drupal is using. They're using it to identify the device of humans actually um, logging and creating accounts, but it can also be used obviously to detect bad bots or automated threats that are hitting your site. And so I wanted to sort of explain a little bit with a sort of real world example that's sort of different from um, what, what the Drupal example is. And, and recently we found um, a bot that was attacking gift cards and it we called it gift ghost bot. Um, what it was doing was it was going across, um, we found it on um, almost a thousand domains that Distill protects. Um, and it was going across and trying to, to do, you know, hit the gift card check balance process on all of these sites, whether they be coffee merchants or um, you know, department stores or online retailers, if they had a gift card process, that process was getting hit with people sitting there saying, do you have this um, gift card number? And if it does, give me the balance. And that way they knew whether a gift card number had a balance that they could then go and use to go and purchase a, an item or to sell on the dark web. Um, and so we saw this attack start um, you know, on our systems um, at the end of February, and it sort of peaked up uh, during March. Um, and it was interesting, if, if, if you go to it, that we, we found that there were three profiles of the gift ghost bot. And it started off as a, as a, as a, a, a Linux um, with 30 user agents attached to it in the profile. Um, we had another one which had 500 user agents on, on, on a Mac system. Um, we had another 210 user agents on a, a Win32 system. We saw this across multiple sites. When we started blocking each of them, it was amazing to see that the bot operator changed and suddenly made their profiles uh, iPhones, or, or Androids and used another bunch of user agents. So the, the real cat and mouse game that Tim was talking about, the arms race, that's exactly what happened. The, the, these bots are changing their position to make themselves look different um, and the fingerprint was still identifying them. And so when you actually looked at some of the numbers associated with a typical retailer during this attack, um, we were detecting 6,400 device fingerprints per hour um, on an average uh, typical retailer. And that's, you know, more user agents as well. And, you know, up to 25,000 IP addresses detected per hour. Now, you know, I, I know Tim likes to block IP addresses, but I don't even think that he could handle 25,000 per hour. Um, but it, so it's, again, you need something that handles this in an automated fashion, not something that is relying on a human to actually do it and intervene and start trying to manually block these things. So I think this sort of gives an example of if a bot operator suddenly starts attacking you, you've now got to deal with a, a significant automated problem and you need some automation to stop it. So if we go to the next thing, we, we, we try to summarize in the bad bot report. So sort of give you a little bit more education about what bots do and what they go after. Um, so we, we would say the four key website attributes that, that are attractive to bad bots um, are first off, if you have some pricing information or some proprietary content, you know, wh whether you maybe have, you know, profiles of, of people's work history or whether you have profiles of, of, you know, products and product reviews and product information. Um, if you have flights or, you know, or hotels, in, you know, listings, Information like that that somebody would want to use, that is attractive to people. So they would, they would want to, to go after that and maybe scrape it. Number two, if you have a sign up or a login or a registration process, which is the Drupal example here, um, number two, you, you're attractive to, a, uh, to, to bad bots. Number three, if you have web forms, i.e. somebody can submit something and put it and they can maybe use and put some comments spam in there, you are again, another, you are attractive to a bad bot. And the final one is obviously if you have a payment process, whether it be a gift card or whether it be, um, you know, processing a credit card, if you have that on it, you are liable to be um, looked at by bots. And I just want to jump in on the web form example because um, the Drupal Association recently built out a, a new web form for um, some of our industry page content that had it followed no pattern. It was no existing form that any any bot designer um, would have seen on Drupal.org before. And nevertheless, as soon as we deployed it, we had spam submissions in less than five minutes. Um, it's kind of incredible uh, how quickly you can be made a target. 
it, it is. It, I mean, you know, it's, it's automated, right? It's, uh, you know, they're looking for these, these kinds of things. And if they find it, then they're going to go after it. So it's, uh, you, you know, the next slide sort of shows you the, the likelihood of if you have those four attributes, um, for example, if you have un uh, unique content or pricing, 97% um, of websites um, that have that, they will be attacked. We, we see scrapers on them. If you have um, a login page or a sign up page, 96% of those sites will have bad, bad bots on them. If you have a form that can be filled in, uh, a third of all sites that have form will have spam bots on them. Um, and here's the one that's maybe perhaps more interesting. If you have login pages, 90% of websites will have bad bots behind the login page. That means they've logged in, they've got through, and they're actually doing something behind the login page. So protecting that login page alone is not enough. So just going through a little bit more detail about each one. Um, it's interesting if you, if, you, if you haven't looked at the automated threat space or bad bots before, I, I would recommend looking up the OWASP Automated Threats Handbook. It, it itemizes all of the threats that um, are, are, are currently being tracked by that organization um, and sort of explains what they are and what they do. So for, for this first one, when, when you've been scraped and they're, they're scraping your pricing or, or something like that, the, the, the automated threat is scraping. And, and we would deem this to be a very simple bot. It, it, it doesn't have significant amount of sophistication technically, um, um, but it's seen um, it's very widely distributed and seen to ha happen on lots of sites. And so what does that, that bot do? That bot does, it scrapes for the data, it scrapes for prices, um, it scrapes for competitive intelligence, right? And, you know, one of the, the, the biggest thing is, is that lots of travel sites, for example, would, would scrape prices against each other so that they could compete against them. Um, and then you've got aggregators who are, you know, aggregating different, um, you know, sources of information in one spot, and those are scraping your content and putting it on their site and, and, and maybe gaining benefit from it. So what gets scraped is, 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 is an amazing amount of thing, but it's not that technically hard to do. Um, and so if I go to the next slide, um, you know, bad bots love login pages. Um, you, what you see is, again, this is a more sophisticated bot. And what the threats that you see here, um, the OWASP threats from the automated handbook, they call it credential cracking and credential stuffing. And this is far more sophisticated because they're basically trying to sort of get into the account. And so let me show you a little bit about how that happens. What happens there is how credential stuffing works. So if you hear about a breach in public of, you know, a business has been breached and there are you know millions of credentials that have now been made available um, what you're liable if you have a login page you are liable to have that list run against your um, login page or registration page um, to see if that account exists on it because they're going on the human premise that many of us use the same login and password across multiple sites so even though um, you may change your, your password on the site that announced it was breached. If you use that password on another site, suddenly now a bot operator can use that against that other site and go around and see, yes, I see that account there, I logged in, now I'm in, I can change things, I can log you out, I can commit some fraud with it, I can buy something, um, I can, you know, and that creates a whole bunch of downstream effects for the business itself, if they've got to deal with uh, unlocking a, a, a hijacked account, or they've got to deal with some customer service issues with some fraud on that account. Um, so stopping people from getting into an account is, you know, using this technique of credential stuffing is very, very, very important. Um, and so, but again, like, like I said earlier, protecting your login page is not enough. Um, when we see the volume of bad bot login requests, um, we only see a quarter of them are actually login requests. Three quarters of them are actually requests once they're logged in. So doing something behind or beyond the login page. Um, and so for a website operator or, or a, somebody who's, who's, who's want, running a business online, it's important to know that you must protect those, site, the, those pages behind, not just the login page. That's just the entry point, not where most of the damage happens. And so what happens um, behind uh, the login page? Um, 
So what you have is a more sophisticated attack here, and the OWASP threats that are most applicable here are, are carding, card cracking, cashing out. This is where the fraud is happening behind the login. You know, maybe there's a payment process that they can go and attack. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a place where the fraud um, can occur. And um, if you uh, think about it, what can happen is that there's financial frauds, um, there is uh, there's spam that can happen behind the accounts. You know, that's what was obviously the Drupal example was somebody was logging in. They were logging in as a real user and then using and putting spam behind that. And so that's where the, the behavior happens. Um, there's phishing attacks. So, so if you can take over an account, you can do a whole bunch of things um, that other users, you know, that, 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 are, that are to your advantage if you're a bad bot operator. Um, now, the, the spamming one is, is one obviously that's uh, very dear to Tim's heart and, and dear to the Drupal uh, community. So um, it's, we would call this sort of a, a moderate um, bot in sophistication because sometimes it's a bot that, that's doing it, but sometimes in this, in this case for, for Drupal, it was humans were opening the accounts and then they were, they were the pasting the, the spam forms in and, and using it that way. Um, but it's, it's an interesting one that a third of sites are, deal with that problem. Um, now, beyond those four, there are some sort of um, automated threats that are collateral damage, right? So the more of this kind of behavior, whether it be somebody attacking your login page or scraping your content or, 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 or trying to you know, post fake spam uh, com content, you can, you can get a lot of this bad bot traffic, you can get spikes, and this spike can lead to application denial of service. Now, it's not anything that volumetric is, um, DDoS is going to prevent because it doesn't look like that. It looks like normal requests, normal users doing things, but really, it's a bad bot that's doing these things against your site. And so, um, uh, we see a lot of application denial of service things happening um, on, you know, on a third of sites that we sit in front of just because of bad bots, not because of human traffic, not the spike in the human traffic. This is just the spike from a bad bot doing something. Um, and so the final bit here is the other collateral damage that, um, and I, you know, Tim mentioned it earlier, was all your web analytics are wrong. Because they can load JavaScript and um, they can do, they can, you know, these bots are sophisticated enough that they skew all your analytics. So if you're using Google Analytics and you're making decisions based on where you place ads or, or, or you know, where you should place bets and, and investments, um, you can realize that maybe, you know, a quarter of your traffic, 20% of your traffic could be completely bogus and your metrics and your, your conversion tracking is completely wrong. Um, and we, we have a, a, a customer of ours, StubHub, and that is one of the things that they use Distill for was to make sure, clean out their traffic of, um, you know, bad bot traffic so that they could understand what the conversion rates were with more accuracy. And once we cleaned the traffic out of bad bots that were doing things on their site, now they were better to make, they were, they, they were um, able to make better decisions on where they should invest and, and, and the process for getting um, improved conversions. Um, so one thing I wanted to do was just sort of, you know, before we close out, was just sort of give you a, a quick overview, just sort of um, so that you understand technically uh, what the distilled product does and, and, and how it gets used. So I just wanted to take you through this, this chart. Um, and so from the left, as you see the, the, the human, the bad bot, and the, and the good bot traffic coming in on the arrows to the left, it goes into the blue box. Um, and the blue box, its first thing it does is it, it identifies the traffic and says, all right, using the high def fingerprint, are you a real user behind a browser or are you a bot? Um, and what we do is we do a bunch of tests and we, we fingerprint the device. And this is where the high def fingerprint comes in. And, and we use a bunch of information, that 200 attributes that we pulled from um, the device. And then we sit there and say, okay, we've got the fingerprint now. And then we check the largest known violators database in the industry, um, which is a shared fingerprint, uh, device fingerprint uh, database of you know, for, from all of our sites. So all, you get the wisdom of the crowd, you know, so the fingerprints from every other uh, Drupal, uh, every other distilled deployment um, are shared here in this known violators. And if we've seen you already, we block you immediately. So you never even get access to um, the web, web infrastructure because we've already identified it. If we haven't already identified it and it's a new um, bot coming in, um, then what we do is we do, uh, we distill the traffic and that's that next layer there. We, we do a bunch of traps and challenges and and those traps can be sort of geofencing, can be um, blocking certain IP ranges, can be rate limiting, 
Um, they, uh, they can be sort of injecting JavaScript tests. Um, they can be doing a whole bunch of things. But then there's also a bunch of challenges that we say, can you prove to me that you're a browser that actually works? Um, and what we're doing is saying, you know, putting puzzles in front of uh, the, the browser and say, if you can solve this puzzle, you're a real browser. If you can't, um, we know you're not a real browser because a real browser would be able to do this. So there are a whole bunch of checks, uh, checks and challenges. There's, there's honeypot links that are, that, are, that are thrown in there. There's, there's many challenges. And what you do is, if you start to fail those, those traps and challenges, then we've identified you as a bad bot and then you don't get any further. And all of this is obviously happening before you even get to the actual infrastructure that's being protected. So we're sitting in front of the site, we're sitting in line uh, and doing this before, um, before any damage can be done. Done. And then beyond those, that first request, we've got this machine learning module where we learn uh, the behavior of, you know, typical good behavior and bad behavior around the network, around um, all the sites that we protect. And we have, we have two sort of machine learning um, models. One is the global network, what looks normal on the global network. So it's again, sort of learning from all the other deployments. And then also what, what do we learn from your domain specific um, users. So there's a, a typical user does these types of behavior and they get clustered together. Anybody outside of that normal cluster of use, uh, human user, they get flagged as that maybe there's something that there's going wrong there. So the machine learning is constantly looking at the, um, at the, the traffic and they're, they're, they're sort of improving the detection methods. And then we have the ability to respond. We have the ability to respond using sort of universal ACLs, um, throwing up uh, captures, throwing up blocks, you know, silently monitoring. There's a whole bunch of granular responses that we can do based on per page per path um, that's that's so and all of this happens automatically it, it's set um, and so when it's needing to block those 21,000 IP addresses that Tim can't manage to do uh, manually um, the machine will do that for you um, and then the final one is we, we also have um, a, an analyst managed service that will manage the whole program for you so they will you know really take care of the problem for you and do this sort of arms race uh, battle for you so that you you know, you can rest easy doing the rest of your job rather than worry about cleaning your traffic. Um, they still can take care of that and um, the analyst managed service does that. So I just wanted to give you an overview on what the product does and how it works um, to, so, that, so that you get some sort of context. Um, and, and finally, sort of say if there's more, there's a lot more data in our bad bot report um, that we recently published. So please go to distillnetworks.com um, and download it. Um, it's full of 40 pages of statistics about bad bots and what they're doing on websites. Um, and it really is, I, I think, uh, you know, an interesting read for people who are wanting to learn about how this website can get abused uh, by bad traffic. Awesome. Thanks very much, Edward. Um, I know that uh, on, at the association side, we found the, the, the tools that you provide to be tremendously helpful. It's really helped to protect the volunteer efforts that had previously been so absorbed with the spam fighting on Drupal.org and, and let us use that effort for more productive means for contributions to the project. Um, and that's been really great. Um, I wanted to invite everyone who's uh, uh, listening live or watching this recording to join us at DrupalCon Baltimore. Um, Distill Networks is going to be giving a presentation at DrupalCon. It will be from 3.45 to 4.15 p.m. Eastern Time on Wednesday the 26th. Um, so I hope you'll be able to join us there and learn more. Um, sessions are also recorded at DrupalCon, so that should be available as well if you're not able to attend the con directly. Um, and Edward, can you tell us a little bit more about this Distill offer? Yeah, yeah. For uh, anybody who's watching this, uh, um, you know, we've we've got an offer of two free months of Distill just to Drupal community users, um, and so that that offer is valid until the end of the month. So if you just go to distillnetworks.com and 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 sort of fill out the contact us page and say this is where you saw us. Um, and you know you 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 heard about us on this webinar. Um, we'll be we'll be happy to honor the two free months of distill for you. So hopefully that's um, an, an incentive to sort of give you a chance to sort of help clean your traffic. And uh, you know we we'd be delighted to sort of chat with you further about what what, what problems you're you're uh, you're, you're dealing with because it, it you know in the, in the community of this we, we we see that there's a lot of different use cases where bots are doing um, these sort of malicious things. And, and you know it's sort of it's it's only the, the you know the create creativity of the human mind that sort of is the limits here it's it's an amazing thing that when you see the different things that people are trying to do and exploit so if you want to have a chat about it please please contact us and we, we'd be more than willing to help you out wonderful all right so at this time i'd like to open up any questions that there may be 
Um, if you're uh, joining us live on the call, there is a Q&A button in your uh, control bar for the webinar where you can uh, ask any questions that you might have. So feel free to put any questions there. Um, I have a couple to start actually. So um, the first one is, um, what if I'm afraid of blocking real users and uh, just of false positives in general? How do you know whether you're, you're um, or whether your measures you put in place are going to keep real users away versus just the bots. Yeah, I think I think that's the that's the holy grail for for many businesses is that they're um, they're worried so much about just converting a, a user to a customer that any manner of false positives is is deemed to be um, you know an increase increasingly negative user experience. So it's something that they, they definitely don't want to do. So um, when, when we're sort of talking to companies about putting processes in place, um, first off, we obviously stress the importance of the high def fingerprint and identifying the device. Um, uh, two, we also sit there and say there are um, there are monitor modes that we can put things in and say, here's, you know, and so you can start to see what we would detect and what gets detected before we actually do it. So we'll say, here's the list of people that we would have blocked if you would, if we'd wanted it, are they real customers? And so you can sort of learn on the job and say, okay, if that was cleaned out, would it have affected a real customer? And many times uh, companies don't, you know, find that they don't have those, um, you know any any false positives in there um we also have um one of the only tools in in cybersecurity that actually monitors its false positive rate which is an interesting one is that we we have a capture solve rate that happens so if we if we're unsure and we serve a capture to a user and we say um okay we we've, we've identified this spike in traffic we've we've served a bunch of captures out we look at actually how many were solved. Um, and so, because a solve rate is, if it's solved, we've obviously got a false positive involved. So, um, and then we look at what's the behavior of that um, false positive report. And so we're actually looking at our performance in itself. It's not a black box. This is a report that you can see yourselves as how many uh, solved captures there were. So um, I think there's many ways of looking at this problem because, it, it, you know, in, in the world of retail and the world of e-commerce, you know, blocking real users, you know, is, is real money being stopped. And so we understand that it's a key part of it. That is why we put all these steps in place, in, 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 including sort of having an, the ability to audit um, whether you have any resolved captures. Awesome. Okay. Um, I've got one more question here, I think, before we wrap up. So um, what if um, I'm a site owner and I know that I have at least one or more of those attributes that you listed as things that make me targets for these bad bots? Um, how do I know if I'm already getting hit by bots? Uh, you know, in, in that, I guess the glib response for that would be, you know, from our data, we, we pretty much can guarantee it uh, that you are being attacked um, and that bots are on your site. Um, how successful they're being, you probably need to look at sort of other things like, you know, account lockouts. You know, are you seeing lots of people who are locked out and they're having to, lock, you know, get, you know, call customer service to get um, or, or do something to get uh, access back into their account? Are you seeing increases in fraud um, on your site? Are you seeing increases in amount of spam or customer service complaints about spam? Are those the things that you're hearing about and seeing in the business? If you start hearing about those, it's pretty much the bots that are probably taking care of that for you um, and doing those things against your site. So if you're starting to see those kinds of behaviors and see those kinds of outcomes for customers, um, that's probably an indicator. Then obviously you can start to look at your logs and start to sort of do some investigation. Um, and ultimately it's, it's, it's a solution that sort of looks at bot mitigation or automating this to, to clean your traffic that probably will, will be something that you'd be interested in um, once you've done those kinds of evaluations. So, um, I, you know, ultimately it's, uh, you know, this, this is a, an arms race and you need somebody who's going to help you defend it because um, we find that IT teams today, they don't have the time to sit there and, and work out and clean their, their, their traffic themselves. Uh, if they can have somebody else, an expert, do it for them, that it, it sort of frees them up to do other things that are uh, more productive to the business uh, and they can sort of, you know, get the peace of mind that somebody's taking care of it for them. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, um, that's our last question. So I want to go ahead and I want to thank uh, Distill Network sincerely for joining us uh, in partnership to help protect Drupal.org, the home of our community. 
I want to thank Edward for joining me as a co-presenter on, on this presentation. And I want to thank everyone who joined us who's viewing this live or who's viewing this um, after the fact. Um, and I hope we'll see you at, at DrupalCon. Um, we'd, be, we'd love to have more conversations about our specific solution on Drupal.org. And I'm sure the Distill team would love to talk to you uh, about your site and the particular challenges that you might face. All right, thanks again, everyone. And we'll see you on our next webinar.